Okay, so that first part was a little bit about what is interpretation, really, the spirit of interpretation, what is it, and a little bit of how to do it, at least in general terms, right? So this, the second part of this evening's presentation that I'd like to focus on is why should you do interpretation in Commons and Prairie or anywhere else, and, and what uh, gifts you are giving to people by doing it, you know, uh, uh, wonderful impacts you're having. I, we, we ended on the thought that you change lives every day, or potentially can. And uh, so we'll focus a little bit you know, on how you do that. So we already talked about the gift of provocation, right? Remember that? Purpose is to, to inspire and provoke people to broaden their horizons, like this kid was provoked to pick up a bunch of, of litter. Um, so we can provoke stewardship. And in this way, interpretation can actually be used as a management tool. And frankly, one of the big incentives uh, for interest in master naturalists is because you folks are going to go out there and volunteer now, right? And earn your hours. <coughs> and in doing so, you can essentially be a management tool to, to some agency. You're going to be useful uh, in helping them meet their objectives. And uh, so there's different things, and I, and I want to go through this pretty quickly, but, but the studies have shown that interpreters, uh, if it's well done, you, they can decrease vandalism, they can decrease poaching, littering, other destructive behaviors, increase carrying capacity. And what I mean by that, carrying capacity, these are obvious, I think. Um, in, in a few slides, I guess I could give you examples of where this has happened. Uh, but increased carrying capacity, what I mean by that, that might not be as clear. Uh, you as an interpreter, particularly if you work like in a visitor center setting, or a visitor center setting where people come through, you can almost act like an air traffic controller. So if you, if you know that a whole bunch of Boy Scouts just went down this one trail and then a family comes in, you might say, hey, you hear what trails today? And you, well, you might want to try the cattail trail or something, you know, and just spread them out. And, and that uh, increases the carrying capacity. Uh, maybe you've had carrying capacity by some of your other speakers in terms of carrying capacity of deer, right, or something. Maybe you know about biological carrying capacity. But social carrying capacity is how many people can be supported on a site without the experience or the environment being harmed. So the most obvious example of this is crowding, right? Have you ever been someplace that was just too crowded, it was ruined, you wanted solitude, peace and quiet or something, maybe in a campground or on a trail or something that was too crowded? Or the park roads were too crowded, the traffic was too bad in a national park, right? So your experience was ruined. Well, in that case, the carrying capacity didn't exceed. So we can spread people out. We can also spread them out in time, and in addition to space. So we can say, hey, you know, we have a really nice 10 minute movie, and we think you'll enjoy the park much more if you, if you get introduced to the park through that movie. And then you're kind of sticking them over there for 10 minutes, maybe while other people are heading down the trail that way. And if you're really wise about this, you can kind of spread people out in, in space and time. And then, of course, you can also teach them through interpretation about uh, treading more softly on the land and, and acting appropriately and you know, not picking up firewood or, or something like that, whatever, whatever the policies may indicate. There's more management benefits. Um, interpretation of visitor safety. And I don't know if that's such a big deal here at Kanza. This is a super high-risk place. But literally, interpretation of safe lives. And let me just give you one real example that's mentioned in the, the Gifts book. Um, this is on the Columbia River up in the Pacific Northwest. And below Bonneville Dam, uh, fishermen, anglers would go out fishing, and I, don't, I can't explain the physics of it, but somehow they would anchor their boats in, in fast-moving water. If they didn't anchor their boats properly, they would be sucked under and they would drown. And so this was a serious problem. People were drowning all the time. I mean, all the time. It was a regular event. Families, <coughs> kids, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters. And so, of course, you know, the Corps of Engineers, like most park people, the first thing they do is try to regulate. You know, they put up a sign saying, don't do such and such. But nobody reads that, and very few people obey those signs. It would be something to know. So finally, sort of as a last resort, uh, they turned to their interpreters, their communication specialists. And through storytelling, through making cartoon images, through taking the message away from the boat ramp where nobody <coughs> reads this. At least, I don't know if you do boating. I used to own a boat years ago. And the last place I would be inclined to read something was at the boat ramp, right? I mean, that's the most hectic place in the world, right? You're trying to back the trailer down, and people are honking, and they're trying to get in and out. I mean, I hate it, you know? It's, you're not going to sit there and read a long thing. So, but they would take the message, they took the message out to the bait shops and the convenience stores and things like that. and and. And I, I'm not exaggerating, uh, after that campaign, there hadn't been a single uh, drowning since. And, and, and I'll just 
to elaborate on the story, uh, this, this gifts book that I have over here uh, that we've been talking about tonight, it's relatively new. It just came out about a, a year ago. It's the third, it's really the third edition of this book. Um, and I, we told that story in the first edition, which was in the ni late 90s. And, and I thought, man, this is going to be pretty old. I wonder if that's still true. You know, maybe we can't really say that anymore or whatever. So I actually contacted the Corps of Engineers guy, the guy, Patrick Berry is his name, there uh, at Bonneville. And I said, Patrick, remember that story you told us? And we put it in the book and all that. I said, I imagine there's been some loss of life since, you know, but you know, just update me because we're updating the book. And he said, no, Ted. He said, there still hasn't been a single drowning because I mean, isn't that amazing? After like decades or more, I mean, literally, interpretation has saved lives, and and it's done it in other ways too. You know, you can we can talk about bears and bisons and all kinds of things that uh, where interpreters have actually uh, saved uh, lives through their messages. Interpretation also can support the mission of the agency. Uh, literally, parks have been saved because of their interpreters. I worked with one in Canada when I was doing my PhD that ultimately was saved because of their interpreters. Politically, they were going to shut it down. But the people were had these emotional connections to the interpretation services and to the resource there because of the interpreters, and so there's a public outcry that really saved the park. Um, just another little quick story that shows you how you can, how this can happen is uh, uh, I heard the story of a small park in Tennessee, I think it was, that was like a local park, and it, it had an old cannon in it, it was only a little historic site or something, and it was in disrepair, there was no money to upkeep the place or whatever. They were just going to close it, sell it off. And uh, as a last resort, again, they kind of turned to the interpreters. And the interpreters started, started letting the kids blow off the cannon on Saturday afternoons. And <laughs> just that little simple thing, right? But, but there's a powerful message in that. And, and uh, whenever I think of this story, I think of it, there's a Danish proverb that says, if you take the child by the hand, you take the mother by the heart. And that's what happens, right? And so the kids got engaged in it, and therefore the parents got engaged in it. And just that simple little thing brought enough political cachet around the park or whatever to actually sort of save the park. So, you know, interpreters have, can support the mission. Uh, they can help with compliance of rules. And, uh, and, uh, and again, give the gift of stewardship. And this is all, that, all under that provocation principle, though. We're provoking different behaviors, different thought processes. Now, this looks really boring, I know. <laughs> but, but just like the equation in the first show, and the first show, the first <laughs> presentation, uh, this, this makes me feel smarter about myself because it's a theory. So we have theories. <laughs> and, but in all, I, I joke, but in all seriousness, you know, I've been giving you, and I go around a lot of times talking to sort of cynical crowds, say, yeah, right, and I'm doing this cheerleading, rah rah stuff for interpretation. Um, I'll tell you an endless number of happy stories about interpretation, but there's a, there is a theoretical basis for this actually working. And I, and I already said, a lot of interpretation is really crappy, okay? So not every interpreter program is going to change anything. But if it's done well, it can. And, and this is a theory uh, that applies to all of our lives, and not just interpretation, but in everything we do, okay? It's called the theory of planned behavior. And uh, it used to be called the theory of reasoned action, and they tweaked it a little bit. And uh, I think it really uh, explains, hopefully you'll see that this can really happen. This is how interpretation works to change behaviors. So like forever and ever and ever in our field, we, we used to say, uh, and the Park Service still says it. They have this little motto that, let's see, like something like, um, through education, understanding, through understanding, appreciation, through appreciation, protection. You might have heard that. That's like the National Park Service motto for interpreters. But, and we've always thought, right, I mean, a whole profession of environmental education has been built on, let's just change people's attitudes and then they'll take care of nature, right? We just got to change their attitudes, change their attitudes. Well, back in the 60s, late 60s and, and early 70s, social psychologists were studying the link between attitudes and behaviors, and they were finding there wasn't a very good link at all. They would do studies on hiring practices, for example, of hiring of women and minorities. And they would ask the employer their attitude about hiring a woman or hiring a minority. And that the employer might say, oh, sure, I'll, I like hiring women and minorities or whatever, right? A good positive attitude. But then they would look at the records and find that the behavior didn't match the attitude. Or even, strangely enough, vice versa. Someone might say, no way, I wouldn't hire a woman or I wouldn't hire one of those minorities. And then if you check, they actually did. And there was very little match between attitude and behavior. 
to the point that uh, we were just talking about, I mentioned a guy's name, John Hindy in Idaho. He was a dean at the University of Idaho. He wrote a, 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 an editorial for the Journal of, Inter uh, Journal of Edu Environmental Education, Journal of Environmental Education, and, and it was titled The Folklore of Environmental Education. And he, it was hard hitting, and really, if anybody cared enough to read it and to really be worried about stuff like this, it undermined our whole profession. So we don't have a leg to stand on. We're out there trying to change attitudes, but that doesn't mean anything regarding changing behavior. At least it's not correlated with strongly. So, I mean, if people cared enough, they were sort of, should, have, should have been worried, you know, in our profession. But along came a guy named Fishbein, University of Illinois, he's still there, and, and, and mm -hmm. some others. They came up with this theory. So let's just go through it real quick. And as I do this, so think about yourself. Each one of you, and I'll think about myself, in terms of how this applies to you and the stuff that you do. So we have a behavior. It can be anything, okay, a behavior. It's based on an intention, so you say, I'm going to do this. So this doesn't apply to like a knee-jerk reaction, you know, an instinct or a reflex or something, okay? It's, yeah, it's anything that's thought out. Like, I want to do this, I'm going to do this, I choose to do this, right? Well, there's a choice involved. It's based on intentions. <coughs> okay, there's three things that affect our intentions to do something. First is, can we do it? Do we think we can do it? Climb the mountain, drive the car, throw the trash out the window, get away with the crime, I mean, whatever you want to do. Do we think we can do it? Do we have the skill? Is there a favorable setting? Is there a physical barrier? Okay, and that's self-efficacy is one way of talking about it. So, can we do it? Obviously, if we, we want to do it, but there's no way we can do it, it's just not possible. You know, there's a big wall there, we can't get through the wall. Then that stops right there, right? So if we have this, that's one thing. Then there is the attitude part of it, all right? A favorable attitude towards the behavior. But then this was the piece that was missing, the subjective norms. If you all understand norms, norms are sort of what's, what's normal, what's to be expected in your group, right? And then you have a motivation to comply with that. Now it may be weak or strong, but you may be strongly motivated to, uh, to be normative and comply. Now here's where I want you to think about yourself. Each of us is somewhere on this line here. Some of us are more strongly, all right, our behaviors are more strongly determined by our attitudes. We don't care so much about what other people think. Others of us may be, be way down there, and we, 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 we may want to do something. We may want to, I don't know, litter, that's a bad example, or we may, may want to do something, but we, we don't do it because we know that somebody won't approve of it. You know, our spouse, our friends, our family, uh, neighbors, whatever. There's some normative pressure here to not do what we would normally do, right? So if you act, Often, if you act, and I think you would see this in life all the time, right? This is also sort of called peer pressure, you know, right? So, so you don't really, maybe you don't have the right attitude. Normally, you wouldn't do it. Your attitude would conflict with this, but because of this normative pressure, you do it. And by the way, I don't know about you, but every time I hear the word peer pressure, the first thing I always think of is teenagers. Yeah. But we all have peer pressure. Too, <coughs> I don't know why. The, I don't know why it's we've always just assigned peer pressure to young people. I have peer pressure. I know that. But anyway, um, so if you're, if you're that way, if you're the kind of person that really wants to make everybody else happy and fit in and be real careful about uh, not having anyone think badly of you, you worry a lot about what people think, this will be more stronger in determining your behavior. There's other people at the other end of the spectrum where they don't care about that kind of thing. Maybe the uh, Lady Gaga's of the world. I'm not even a Lady Gaga or something. <laughs> I always like to work with Lady Gaga in any of my talks, but anyway, so, um, so it's somebody like that, they're not really normative, they're not, you know, the old days it was Madonna or Dennis Rodman, you know, the bulls with dressing up in a wedding dress and all that stuff, right? So that's not real normative, you know, but I don't think he cares, I think he's up here, you know, and that's okay, no, no judgments, but um, in terms of affecting his behavior, he's not worried about this, so this arrow is stronger than that arrow, right? Okay, so... The stuff that's in green are the three places where we interpreters can affect behaviors. We can teach people how to climb a mountain, how to <coughs> snorkel, um, how to uh, uh, read a, a foreign language or to read a history or understand a dichotomous key of plants or something, right? We can teach people stuff, like uh, skill sets. Uh, how to identify plants, you know, which is what you guys are learning or have learned. So we can give them the skill to carry out behavior. That's pretty straightforward. We've spent our whole history of our profession trying to change attitudes by teaching people facts about things. And then also, you see the bottom part of that? That's, that's all this sort of psycho talk here, but it's, it's uh, 
police, police of the behavior leads to certain outcomes and evaluations of these outcomes. That's the emotional part of it. Um, that's the should part of it. So you might believe that the, that the, that the cons of prairie sets the prairie on fire uh, periodically, but you might not agree with that. You might think, man, that's bad. It's killing all the animals or something, right? And so you might have a negative attitude about that behavior because of your evaluation of the facts. And this is really interesting too, because if you're an interpreter, and if you, if you know your audience, remember case of A, and if you can do surveys or whatever, find out what your audience knows and what they don't know and how they feel and how they don't feel, you can figure out, are, are, is my audience, do they have their facts straight? Because facts might be wrong, or they might be right. Or is their emotional response to that uh, something that's um, different than what our agency's uh, goal is? Yeah. I can give you a good example. Okay. Is when when we try to talk geology to Christian schools, uh -huh. it's always becomes very interesting when we try to get geological history into people who believe that the Earth is six thousand right. years old. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that would be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a different fact, um, but then you know one of the things uh, one of the things then to think about is. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, but it just opens up a whole other realm of possibilities. When you're going back to your themes and stuff, it's like, you know, you're probably not going to, I, I think, you're probably not going to change their minds, right? No, we don't. We and, don't and of course, you're not, they're not going to change your mind, right? <laughs> so then I would wonder, well, what's, what is the theme of, of that presentation? Clearly, it's, you know, you can talk about things that you agree on. They would both agree that sedimentary rock are layers, right? I think they attribute it often to the noatic flood, right, from Noah or something like that, right, I think? So, so they agree, they can see that it's layers of stuff. And they can see maybe what we really care about is that they understand erosion, because that affects everybody. I mean, I guess what my point is, if you can find common ground of the important stuff um, with groups like that, that might be more productive, you know? Uh, but you're but you're right, it's a challenging thing, and, and the fact that you, that's, a, that's a real know your audience deal, you know. Um, oh gosh, I heard a funny story recently, I wish I could remember. Somebody said, talk to somebody, somebody, the interpreter was talking to some group, and I think it was a, some sort of religious group, but they were talking all about chickens and stuff. Anyways, this group I think were vegetarians, I don't know if it was an Eastern group or something, and anyways, they totally, Totally missed the bug. I mean, they were laughing at themselves, but it just reminds us, know your audience, remember case of A. <laughs> You're not going to get through, but yeah, that's, that's a good example. The normative stuff, though, this is where, I think this is sort of the newer stuff, but this to me is so exciting. This is what's happening in our field right now. We're finding out that we can use norms to really change behaviors. And so one of the things that people are doing now is we find that uh, since norms are powerful, we get much better compliance with our rules if we make the good behavior normative. So I don't know about you, but, um, so for example, speaking of religious people, churches and stuff like that, I know when I used to go to church sometimes, I would hear from the sermon, uh, in a nutshell, I would hear basically the message that, uh, you know, all these people are out there doing this stuff, but don't you do it. And I'm thinking, man, everybody else is doing it, it must be pretty good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, 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 you know, he, sets, he would set it up as the, the bad behavior as the norm, right? And then expect me to be non-normative. I mean, we shoot ourselves in our foot. But don't we do the same thing with, uh, with some of our conservation messages? Everybody's littering. Don't you litter, you know? Uh, right? So, man, everybody else is littering, you know? So we do that all the time, and, and it's natural. Cause, and I've done it. You, know, you try to make an appeal to people, right? So you have to set up that there's a problem, and then you ask them to address, help, help you with the problem. So when you're describing the problem, whether it's poaching or littering or parking on the grass or whatever, you uh, you know you, you, you sort of lay out you've got this huge problem, you know, because you want people to help. You know, you think that's the way to get them help, but in, so, in doing so, you're setting the bad behavior being normative. So now what we're finding is we're finding that some parks have had really good success saying that. Um, 89% of our park visitors use the waste receptacles. Please use the waste receptacles too. All of a sudden, that makes you kind of the jerk and the non-normative person if you're in the litter, right? I've seen a, I've seen a message like that with speeding. 98% um, of our park visitors obey the speed limit. Please obey the speed limit too. You know, it makes you be the oddball 
you know, if you're doing the wrong thing, rather than the other way around, you know. And uh, so, I mean, aren't we all inclined to do something if everybody else is doing it, more or less? I mean, I think even as adults, that sounds like a kid thing, but I think we're a lot like kids. Uh, another application of this norm thing is, is uh, which I think is really interesting, is uh, the Petrified Forest. Maybe, maybe you probably have been there, uh, the, the National Park. Um, you know, almost everybody would take a piece of petrified wood, right? I mean, I had one when I was a kid. So, I mean, don't, if we all confess that everybody's been there, we probably all have a little piece in our attic or somewhere, right? A shoebox or something. And so people would just steal petrified wood left and right, and obviously that's not good. And so, uh, so of course, you know, the first thing was to say, please don't steal, you know? And, and, um, and I, I knew people were there, and they would find they would find an 80 pound chunk in a trunk of a car, a huge chunk. <laughs> and, and the dad would say, oh, my little kid must have put it in there. He said, oh, boy, this high, could have nearly budged it, you know? Um, I heard another story about a, a, park, a, a female park visitor who was in a two-piece bathing suit, a very small two-piece bathing suit, barely the way the story goes. But she had lumps where women don't have lumps, where she had put rocks in her petrified uh, women inside her bathing suit. That was pretty obvious, you know? Um, so like, people just, you know, that stuff's just like, it was just leaving the park, you know, by the trunk loads. So, um, with, with sort of the hardcore law enforcement thing, right? But what they did is, again, they involved interpreters and involved subject So now what you know what you do when you go there? At least last I heard, versus, they, they had you sign a pledge card when you come into the gate, or they invite you to. But it's kind of, if you say, no, I'm not going to take the pledge, what does that tell you, right? That's kind of more than a run the bat, right? So, I can't so invariably, dad would take this and sign, and then maybe they'll pass it around to the kids or the mom or whatever in the car and say, I won't steal any petrified wood. Well, you set up a norm then. Now, now if you steal the wood, you're not only a thief, but you're a liar. You know? mm -hmm. And not to say that it's 100%, some will still do it probably, but <coughs> it's, cut, it's, it's increased compliance by, by way high, 90 some percent as I recall. Uh, even college kids, you know, there's a normative pressure. A bunch of college kids are there on spring break going to, and if they all sign that I'm not going to steal, even amongst them, you know, where you might not be quite like a family unit, but there's enough of a social pressure there, a normative pressure, that all of a sudden they said, hey, you know, you promised not to steal petrified wood. It's a very powerful thing. So, so again, I don't, you know, I don't normally like to dump a lot of theory stuff, but, but it just shows you that it can be done, right? I mean, can you see how interpreters can, can really do it? We can really change behaviors. Uh, uh, based on this particular model of, of behavior uh, change. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go through this real quickly because anytime you start talking about changing people's behaviors or thoughts, you get accused of elitism, especially if you're a government employee. Like, I pay your salary. How dare you tell me how to think or how to act, right? I mean, there's the, that's built in. So let me just go through this list. Uh, humility. Suggest to people what the, not what they must do, but what they can do. Not what they must think, but what they can think. Um, this might even apply to the evolution creation thing. You know, say, okay, now that's one model, but most scientists today, this is this is an alternative. You know, uh, and then uh, I think it was um, Ritz Carlton uh, hotel chain founder. You know, his, his mantra for his staff was always to be ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And I overheard that somewhere, actually in an airport, some people talking about that. And I, but it occurred to me, as I was eavesdropping, <laughs> it's a kind of another conversation. That's really what interpreters should be. That's what docents should be. You know, ladies and gentlemen interpreting the ladies and gentlemen. And, and so when you do suggest changes in thoughts or changes in behavior, you're not like being preachy, you know, and, and condemning people or whatever. Uh, and then the last thought on this provocation gift, it doesn't all have to be a management tool stuff, right? I mean, it doesn't, so far all my examples have been, you know, stopping littering, stopping speeding, stopping theft. But we can provoke people to enrich their lives and enrich their communities, right? It doesn't all have to be the management tool stuff. So. Okay, let's talk about another gift entirely, the gift of joy. You guys, you docents, kind of the docents, when you're out there on the trail, or when you're doing your 30 hours of service, maybe someplace else, wherever, you have the opportunity to give the gift of, of joy. And I don't know if this is the best metaphor in the world. I know it's sort of the antithesis of a nature sort of thing, but, but I think that interpretive sites, including Consecrary, are, I think of them as factories. And I think of one of the things that they manufacture is they manufacture experiences. 
and they can produce a really priceless product, which is a happy experience. And people will come out here and they have an experience out on the trail there, and it may be good, it may be bad, and if, and if it's bad, they probably won't consume that experience again, you know, pay for it with their time and gas money or whatever, they maybe they'll go to Milford or someplace else or go who knows where uh, to purchase essentially their next, next experience that's being manufactured. It's very much a commodity. We live in an experience economy where we buy experiences. That's why Starbucks can charge $5 for a cup of coffee. It's because we're not just buying the coffee, we're buying the Starbucks experience, right? And so we sell experiences to people. We do that at places like, like Kansa here. But to me, that's a very profound uh, thing. Um, let me tell you a little bit, of, use Disney as an example here. Um, we create happiness, okay? I mean, that's pretty cool. Just think about that. You create happiness. You create joy. And at Disney, when you get hired out of Disney, um, one of any of the Disney properties, you have your job description. And the number one uh, responsibility on every job description, whether you're cooking hot dogs or whether you're an accountant in the office, is, and it goes like this, to facilitate a happy experience for our guests. To facilitate a happy experience for our guests. And so I've been told by Disney people that if an accountant was walking across the property with a briefcase and a suit, and they saw that the tables weren't being bust, and they couldn't keep up cleaning tables, that they're supposed to put down their briefcase and start cleaning tables, because that would facilitate their number one job, is to facilitate a happy experience for our guests. I was telling this story in a presentation not long ago, and uh, you know, and obviously I repeat things that I understand to be true, and I, I always wonder, I wonder if that's still true. You know, I, I, after time, I wonder if that's really still true about Disney, and I, I trust that it is. But someone came up after me, after to me after and I said, I worked at Disney. I said, Oh, really? I said, Is that still true? You know, I don't want to be telling things that aren't true. He said, Oh, yeah. Not only that, he said, Most people don't know this, but Disney staff. Um, have these little cards that they're authorized to give out these little passes that are and they're called bad day passes, or at least that's what they call them, I don't know if that's the official name. And if they see a family with the kids crying and they're having a miserable day for whatever reason the lines are too long or whatever, they can they can just give the family one of these things and they can you can do a couple different things. It can you can move them to the front of the line. So there's a little secret for you. Have your kid <laughs> pinch your kid or something. <laughs> they can move you to the front of the line. Or uh, another, they have another where you, they, you get free ice cream. You know, it's free ice cream, and it's like a, a free ice cream deal. And they can just basically give out these happiness stickers, you know, or coupons. If someone's not having a happy experience, they create happiness. They create joy. And um, uh, yeah, these bad with these bad day cards, and that's everyone's number one job. Uh, I get carried away on this gift a little bit, I think, but but I'll do it again. Uh, you know, I always think when I go to K-State football games, and you know, at the beginning, they always have a preamble with the Declaration of Independence thing, and they always talk about, right, the whole stadium goes, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And every time I think about that, I think, pursuit of happiness, that's what you guys are doing. You know, that's what we do. That's what my park and rec majors are doing. They're the pursuit of happiness people. They're right up there with life and liberty, you know? I mean, that's how important it is. It's the pursuit of happiness and the creation of happiness that, um, that, uh, that we have the privilege and, and uh, the responsibility uh, and obligation really to do, to do in our careers. Um, Stephen Covey, who many of you are familiar with, he wrote that Seven Habits book, right? Mm -hmm. Seven Habits Highly Effective People. You may, if you've read that book, you may remember in there that he, he says in there that um, on, when you're on your deathbed, when people are on their deathbeds, nobody ever says, gee, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. That's what they, that's Stephen Covey pointed that out. When people are on their deathbeds, literally or metaphorically, they never say, gee, I wish I would have spent more time in the office. What do they wish they would have done? They wish they would have gone to the Grand Canyon. They wish we would have gone camping more with the family. They wish we would have taken that vacation. I wish we would have done that. And often, it has to do with the realm that we work in, the outdoors, nature, uh, family activities. It, certainly, it, it's leisure time. You know, we sleep about a third of our lives, we work about a third of our lives, and then there's that last third of our lives is that leisure time that that's the purview of what we do as park and recreation professionals, and that's like the, the arena that you guys are going to work in as docents and as master naturalists, and that's the most important third of our lives. Really, that's what defines the quality of our life often. Not that work can't be rewarding too, 
uh, maybe sleep would be rewarding. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, uh, but but seriously, I mean, it's that one third, right? That defines you whether you're sitting on the couch you know drinking beer and watching TV or whether you're out doing something maybe that could be maybe more enriching uh, making memories uh, with family and friends and so forth and that's the arena that we work it's the most important part of life so sometimes my students get kind of they get teased or made to feel dumb or something I think is you know they're park and recreation majors and and uh, that sounds so and then even some of us faculty members, I think we feel a little inferior. You know, we talk to our colleagues or physics, physicists, or engineers, or chemists, or something really important and tangible. <clears throat> but I would maintain that you know, I mean, we're right up there with uh, with healthcare professionals, and we create happiness. That's pretty profound. I mean, that's I think that's just as important as building a bridge or, or doing some other things that other professions do. You know. Um, and again, maybe I just get carried away on this topic, but I, I think it really is one of the, the best ways of doing it. And I, I tell my students, I say, you guys are just like a bunch of Mother Teresas, you know, and just go out there and, and help people with quality of life and, and, and bring people up and so forth. But it's true. It really is true. We give the gift of joy to people. And that's really, I think, a very profound thing. Now, all this fuzzy talk about joy and happiness, you know, and all Disney and all that, um, I just sort of want to bring it back a little bit to the fact that you know we, there is learning involved, and I know some of you may be teachers, and I know some of you have already learned how to teach and these stuff about the prairie and so forth. But they're not an either or, right? Learning can be fun. The more you know, the more fun you can have, right? Um, the uh, the more fun you have, sometimes the more you learn. Learning is strictly a voluntary activity, right? I can't force my students to learn. I can whip them into learning or threaten them with bad grades if they don't learn or whatever. Uh, but you can't do that in the interp world, right? Remember, it's that edutainment, it's it had you have to make it fun and engaging and interesting. Uh, John Burroughs, who was another 19th century naturalist, he wrote an essay that was titled To Enjoy Understanding. And I love that phrase, it's kind of a mouthful, but that's our goal, you know? To get people here at Kanza to enjoy understanding. We want them to enjoy the prairie. That's our number one goal, but with an understanding of at least that's my perspective. I'm going to just skip through that in the interest of time. So, manufacturing happiness uh, requires meeting the needs of people. And remember principle number five, I said there was that second part about, about uh, meeting the needs of the whole person. And I said we would talk about that later. Okay, well, that's here we are now. So, we as interpreters, we have the privilege of actually meeting people's needs. And this, some of you may be familiar with something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And this is based on that. Um, every, the, the first thing that anybody that comes to us needs before they can learn about the prairie, uh, before they can see the beauty in the prairie, uh, the first thing they have to have in that are their physiological needs, right? So if you're thinking, even now, in, in this venue, if you're thinking how hot you are, how cold you are, having to go to the bathroom, if you're hungry, if you have any sort of physiological needs, you're thinking about that and you're not thinking about maybe some of the other ideas that are being communicated. This is the whole deal with school lunch programs, right? School breakfast programs. Kids, if they're hungry, they're going to be sitting there thinking about how hungry they are, and they're not going to be thinking about learning. So, same thing applies in nature, you might say, with, with our guests on our hike. So, and there's ways you can meet that needs I have listed over here. So, when you're out on Kanza, you know, you need to think about are they going to need water, are they going to need shade, um, and how can we make sure that they're comfortable when they're on the hike? And this isn't going to be like the baton death march or something, right? Because if it is, they're not going to learn anything and it's not going to be very productive. So the physiological needs are the most basic. The next most basic needs, of, and again, we all have these needs, regardless of what we're doing. So this isn't just an interpretation thing. This is a life thing. The next is safety and security. There's things we can do as interpreters and talk about safety measures. You know, people, sometimes because we see so many people who don't comply with our rules, we maybe get the idea that people don't like rules. But deep down, studies of people people like rules. They want to know that you're not going to let them walk over a cliff, you know, or or fall into the waterfall. They want to know that they're safe, that there's some structure, that there's some rules there. So provide consistent safety measures, interpret policies. Well, there's a lot of people that don't, you know, know what's true and what's not true. I was talking to a guy the other day, just just this week, when I was in therapy for my arm, a guy on the table next to me was telling me about all the water moccasins that uh, Gary County Fishing Lake and how he doesn't like to fish there because there's so many water moccasins, you know. Well, that's a myth. I mean, there's, 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 I don't know if you've had burp stuff yet, but there's not water moccasins, right? 
uh, except for maybe an extreme south and part of the state. So, uh, so we can interpret things like that. And then, of course, psychological security, too. I've seen interpreters embarrass people. I mean, it's, it's sad. Like, there's a lot of really crummy interpreters out there. Um, you know, make fun of them, be sarcastic, make them feel stupid, um, scold them. And I've had, I've seen a lot of that stuff. So this isn't, again, this isn't, even though you think, well, that's common sense. Common sense isn't always common. So, uh, But the point is, you need to feel safe. That stuff we talked about with kids earlier, you know, kids are afraid of, of nature, afraid of being outdoors. Fear is a tremendously powerful influence. And, and if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm being chased by a lion across the Serengeti, running as fast as I can with the lion nipping at my heels, I can't appreciate the beauty of the baobab as I run by, right? So it's the same thing with, 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 uh, with our guests, too. They need to feel safe. You know, if they're out there worried about uh, massasaugas or copperheads or something on the trail or, or whatever, or scorpions, I don't know. If they're bumblebees. They're, bumblebees. Bumblebees. Yeah, bees. <laughs> exactly. They're not gonna. They're not gonna. They're not gonna be enriched, right? It's not gonna be an enriching experience. Yeah, bees. That's a good example. Next, uh, up this hierarchy comes the needs for love and belonging, and um, and you can see here's ideas of helping meet that need. Um, to me, this is one of the coolest things you can do because, uh, and to me, this is so much more important than teaching them the names of grass or something. I mean, this is so neat to actually. Again, change people's lives, like I said in the earlier presentation. Uh, I, used, I, I lead a lot of bird walks, and sometimes I've even let, led trips on the oceans with for whales and stuff. And sometimes in both those ways, sometimes they cost money, and especially the whale things cost a lot of money. And for many years, I kind of wondered why people would show up, but they wouldn't bother to look at the whale or the birds. You know, they'd have their binoculars, but they would be nice. It wasn't like they were ticked off or anything, but they would just be there and say, "Oh, look at that!" You know, they would they would just chit chat or whatever. They didn't seem to be into it. You know. I could never figure that out. And, and now I think I've come to the conclusion after a long time and after thinking about stuff like this, I think a lot of those people show up because they have a need for love and belonging. You know, they just want to belong to a group. So they want to go out bird watching on Saturday morning. Maybe they're lonely, maybe they live alone. I don't know what the deal is. But, but maybe they just come to feel loved, to feel to be part of a group, feel appreciated. And we have a wonderful opportunity to do that, you know, um, as, as groups and, and individuals come to us. We can help. We can help meet uh, that need. Next, the next one up the hierarchy. I'm not going to go all the way up, but I'm going to go up one more level after this. Is self-esteem. And if you've worked with kids at all and for very long, and even maybe even some adults, but my experience is more with kids when I think of this need. Um, it's often easy to pick out the kid that's sort of the outcast, right? He's dragging along behind, you know, sometimes it's sort of a posture thing. Sometimes you can see that no one else is talking to him. They're sort of the social outcast, the misfit, or whatever, right in the group. And um, probably a self-esteem problem. And again, it's so cool. It's so much fun to be able to, to you know, give him a response, have him help with the campfire, and then give him good pats on the back. And then, man, you did a great job. You know, thanks. And just build him up a little bit with that kind of stuff by giving him responsibilities and, and things, uh, giving him a little special attention. I was talking about this. Uh, a couple of years ago in uh, Delaware to a group, and uh, a guy came up to me afterwards and said, Ted, I really like what you said about self-esteem. He said, can I tell you a story? I said, sure. You know, and he told me this story, and I think it's just the best story I've ever heard about self-esteem. It's, but it's so simple, and I, and I hope you'll see that this, is, this isn't rocket science. That if you're sensitive to this stuff, that you guys as docents out on the trail, you can do this stuff as good as, as, good as the guy I'm going to tell you about. So the guy, it's the way the story went that this guy told me. And by the way, here I am telling stories, right? Principle number three. <laughs> yeah. um, this guy, he had a bunch of boys out on the trail. I don't know if it was a Boy Scouts or a church group or something. And his deal was he would get to a certain point and then he would have kind of like a scavenger hunt thing where he'd send the kids off in different directions to find stuff and report back on what they found. And so he did. He said, oh, but, he, but again, there was a kid there that he felt like a boy that maybe struggled with this for whatever reason, he just sensed that. And so he sent him off in the direction where he knew there was a cave, you know. And so then he blows a whistle or whatever and they come back and what did you find? You go around a circle, you know, I found a feather, I found a stick, you know, something you know, pretty mundane stuff. And they get around, then they get around to this kid, what did you find? And this kid says, I found a cave. And he goes, a cave? A cave? Wow, you found a cave, you know? And he gets all excited and all, and the whole group goes over and explores the cave and and you know, isn't that simple? But that kid probably will never forget that, you know? That might be a lifelong memory for that, for that boy. 
about the day that he discovered this cave. You know, that may affect the rest of his life. I mean, who knows? And it's just so simple, if we're sensitive to it, that we can meet people's needs like that. And again, and link this back to the notion of creating joy. Okay, so then on Maslow's hierarchy, we get up to understanding, right? Provide information, encourage questions, independent learning, provide reports to agency, agency reports, provide access. And to me, this is like, just me, I'm not saying this is bad, to me this is kind of the boring stuff, you know? This is what we've been doing all along. But isn't it stupid for us to jump in at this level of the hierarchy? I mean, I know so many interpreters, and if you ask them what they do, they say, oh, we're going to go out and teach them about uh, oak trees today, or I'm going to teach them about plant succession, or I'm going to teach them about uh, bird migration. Or, and, and nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's okay. But if you don't think about their physiological needs, their security and safety needs, their love and belonging needs, uh, their self-esteem needs, and you jump in here, it's no wonder we're so ineffective sometimes, right? I mean, and yet I, so many of my colleagues, my interpretive colleagues, they just jump in at this point, you know, and they say, well, I got the bird hike, or I got the wildflower hike, or I got the butterfly hike, or whatever, and they just go through the deal, you know, and, you know, maybe with the, without the passion or whatever, but they don't consider anything else below that. And, and frankly, as you can probably tell, I think the love and belonging and self-esteem is even more important than this anyway. But that's, that's a judgment call. You may not agree with that. But the point is, is that you just can't jump into Maslow's hierarchy at this point without addressing all those other things if we really want to be effective uh, in teaching, but also in terms of this creating point. So in summary, Maslow's hierarchy continues on up. But again, in the interest of time, I won't go all the way to the top. Um, it enhances personal growth, it helps people grow, bloom, and experience joy. Okay, just a couple more gifts and then we'll be done. The next gift is the gift of beauty. And this is, this is the way the gift reads from the book. Interpretation should instill in people the ability and the desire to see beauty in their surroundings. Now, I really like this quote. And I'm not sure every hike you'll be able to do this on cons every hike, but I hope that some of your hikes you can create spine tingles. That should be your goal. We should all sort of aspire to create spine tingles, you know? I know it's hard to quantify. And if you go into your boss and if you have to report success or something, I know you can't really go in and say I have 32 spine tingles but <laughs> this month or something. Uh, but, but that's what we should go for, you know? We should try to, and I bet you there's some things out there. You guys know better than I. But there's, I bet you there's things that you know about out there, some things you can show them that will create spine tingles. I don't, you know, and I don't practice interpretation enough anymore. I'm not really an interpreter. I'm just more this cheerleader for interpretation, I guess, or spokesperson. But the only, in recent years, the only time I really experienced this with my college students is occasionally I'll go out and we'll look at the stars. We'll do a night program thing for my interpret class. And when Saturn's uh, visible, and we have a telescope and we put it on Saturn, even my crusty old jaded college students. <laughs> you know, they've seen that little picture with the circle, the planet with the ring around it ever since they could see cartoons, right? Every little cartoon has that. And when they look through there and see that little chartreuse, I don't know if you've all seen it, but it's sort of a greenish yellow, the chartreuse Saturn, and it's the real thing. They won't admit it, but I think, <laughs> I think even my college students have a little bit of spine-tingling moment there, and so that's maybe the best I can do in pr producing those. But, but yeah, we should try, try to do that as we interpret beauty. And here's Here's my personal, this, this involves my personal mission statement and all the work I do and all the books I write, is that it's based on this Elder Leopold quote here. And it says, our ability to perceive quality in nature begins as an art with the pretty. It expands through successive stages of beautiful to values as yet uncaptured by language. So, um, you'll recognize this landscape here and, you know, and you know, the mountain landscape there. And every year, 30 some million people drive I-70 on their way to see the pretty Rocky Mountains. And they drive right past maybe the beautiful tall grass prairie. See that dichotomy kind of pretty and beautiful? So I know my personal mission statement was to help people see beauty in things that are not pretty and in people that are not pretty. And so, so I mean, I'm not a native Kansan, so I don't necessarily have a provincial pride, but I've lived here long enough and I've listened to enough crap about Kansas being flat and boring and I-70. And, and the killer was, the reason why I wrote that Kansas book is that I have two different friends that live in Missouri, and they would tell me that they 
when they go skiing in Colorado, they plan their trips so that they drive through Kansas at night because there's nothing to see there. You all heard that before? I thought, okay, that does it. We've got to do something about this, you know, professionally speaking. But anyway, so my goal in that book and the others and, and everything I try to write about is to help people, help things, help people see beauty in things that aren't pretty. So when I've written articles about birds, for example, I, I tend to write about house sparrows and starlings and things. I mean, anybody can write about eagles or something, you know. But, so that's just my deal, though. I mean, that doesn't have to be your deal, but... But I love this quote, uh, pretty stuff tends to take care of itself, I've sort of found and believe. Uh, and it applies even in cultural sites. These are both white religious buildings, right? <laughs> one, you know, the masses go to that one, maybe not so much the one there, which is actually in one of our national parks, Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, same thing with people who are not pretty, um, helping find beauty in people that are not pretty. But let me go to this art deal, right? Because remember Alba Leopold said it's like art? So this is a picture, and I'm not a big art person. I mean, I love, I, I, I love art, but I don't know a lot about art. And so I, this is a uh, painting by Winslow Homer, and it's a seascape, obviously. And I've always liked it. I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. Look at the nice colors of the sky, the sunset, it's so tranquil. And I get it, right? I can understand this painting, and I think, oh, that's a pretty picture. Uh, so that's pretty to me, right? And then there's this. This painting is worth tens of thousands of dollars. I've been told 50,000, maybe 80,000. 90,000, I don't know how many, that's a painting, it's huge, I took this picture, it was, it was displayed um, in a gallery, um, and I don't see the beauty in that, I, I mean I don't, I'm not saying it's not beautiful, but I don't see the beauty in it, I don't see it's, it's I don't see the value, I don't see that it's pretty, right, I, again, I can, I can get this one, but I don't get that one, so what's the problem, or what do I need? You need to know who the artist was. I need to know about the artist, yeah. Turns out it's an Israeli artist, um, Israel. Um, yeah. I need an interpreter. I need an interpreter, exactly. It's just like that prairie, the mountains in the prairie picture back there. It's not, I need an interpreter. What I, what I don't need is a snooty art curator <laughs> looking down his or her nose at me saying that I'm a moron because I don't see the beauty in this and go, just roll their eyes and say, oh, you know. Be gone with you, you know, you're a, you're a dunce or something, because you don't get it, you know. And yet, aren't we sometimes guilty of doing that same thing with nature? You know, we kind of roll our eyes. They don't understand the beauty of a swamp, the mindless masses. They don't see the beauty of the prairie. We complain about them as if, you know, there's something wrong with those people. No. What they need is they need people just like you to interpret the prairie to show them the beauty in the things that are not necessarily pretty. That you guys are just like the art curator. Going back to this quote, this is like the abstract painting. Most people don't find this beautiful. You guys probably do, that's why you're here. And it took me a while to find the beauty of this, frankly. When I first moved to Kansas, I didn't particularly, wasn't drawn to this landscape. It took me some years before I saw the beauty in this myself. Um, and I had to have people show me the beauty of it, right? Where this is easy, I mean, any, anybody can, you know, any person can say, oh yeah, that's pretty postcard, kind of pretty stuff. But, so, this should all make you feel very needed, <laughs> if nothing else. Because this is our job, this is our mission, or it can be your mission, it's my mission, is to help people see beauty in stuff that's not necessarily pretty. Or people are not necessarily pretty, like the picture of Lincoln, for example. Pretty stuff, again, as I said, sort of takes care of itself. So, along that line of beauty, um, Walt Whitman said, a mouse is a miracle. And if that's true, and, um, and if Henry Miller said, a leaf is an indescribably magnificent thing, then really we're surrounded by all these mundane miracles. Things that aren't knock your socks off beautiful. You know, they're not like the snow-capped peaks and the mountain lakes and all that. But it is true, it's a miracle. A mouse is a miracle, you know? Uh, they can probably see better than us, hear better than us. I mean, I don't know, I'm not a mammologist, but there's a lot of things they can probably do. They're pretty amazing, I think. Same thing, if you took a leaf, if you went outside right now, we're surrounded by miracles. You can take a leaf and if you look closely enough at it, it's a miracle. It's beautiful, right? So we're surrounded by all this beauty, and we just have to help people see it. And so how do we interpret these? Whether it's a grasshopper sparrow or big blue skin. First, the, our, so our first job is to help people notice it. And that's what you guys are going to do on the trail. I'm sure all of you are going to be really good at that because you've learned so much in this class. And you're going to say, hey, look, there's a grasshopper sparrow. Or, hey, look. Here's a big blue step, you know. People call it turkey blue or something, right? You're going to help people notice it. And you can do that by sketching it. People pay more attention if they draw. I don't know if you, 
if you have time to do this or whatever, journaling, have people write about it out on the trail. Um, you can do revelation. Remember, you're supposed to reveal things. So you can do that through maybe a magnifying glass, right? Reveal something that they couldn't see otherwise, or even a microscope or something you can carry out with you. Binoculars, telescopes. The second step is to help people understand them. So again, you know, I've been, I've been, uh, you know, I've been sort of downplaying facts and learning, but I mean, understanding is part of it, right? Remember, information is the raw material of interpretation, but it's not the end of it. It's just the raw material. Okay, help them see the beauty in it. There's beauty in utility and in function, right? Um, and then help people become reconciled to whatever that resource is, whatever that organism is. And let me, again, I'll just share sort of an insight with you about a personal sort of thing. That word reconciled, I, I haven't been talking about that for very many years. It's only been very recently. I was reading a book called The Movable Feast. Have any of you read that, Ernest Hemingway, The Movable Feast? He comes back to Paris, it's really about food. I and mean, he's really, in a sense, kind of interpreting food. But so he comes back to Paris in this book, 1920s. And he writes, the winter life, light was beautiful, the trees were sculptured without their leaves when we were reconciled to them. And I was just reading along, you know. And that, that, that word reconciled hit me. Reconciled. And I actually went to the dictionary. Really, the real dictionary. I didn't click a button. I actually pulled the big old thing off the shelf and... Flip through it, I had to sort of sing the alphabet song, you know, to find the R's and, you know, <laughs> listen to the alphabet. And, and I looked up reconcile, and it means to be in harmony with. Reconciliation is to bring into harmony with. And I think, I love that. I love that notion that you guys are going to be out there in Kanza Prairie and helping people become reconciled to the prairie and become in harmony with the prairie. I think that's so cool. And that's such a wonderful opportunity for you guys uh, to do that. So, yeah, help them notice the stuff then help them understand it, and then be reconciled to that. Um, and, and then, okay, so now, you know, now I've, I know I've talked about death and joy and beauty and all these fuzzy little emotional things, but for those of you that are real practical people in the audience, you know, they're still kind of the nuts and bolts people, the good news is, is that all this beauty stuff and joy stuff helps, steward, uh, helps spread stewardship, the practical stuff, right? Uh, the master naturalist stuff, the conservation activities. Jacques Cousteau said people will only protect what they love. And so we want people, we, you know, um, if people, people care about something, they will care for it. And so we want people to care about it. We want people to fall in love with it. And so what I think master naturalists are, and I think what you docents are, you guys are like the e-harmony of Kansa Prairie. Okay? No e-harmony? The matchmakers? <laughs> <laughs> Your job is to get people to fall in love with Kanza Prairie. That's why I think those, I said it way back at the beginning on those definitions. Remember those definitions were emotional and intellectual connections. Not just the facts, but the emotional connections. That's really what matters. It's the heart more than the head. It really is the heart more than the head. And for too long we've been trying to cram the head with facts and stuff, and it hasn't been very successful. But if we can change people's hearts about the prairie, then as I said, they'll go learn on their own. And it is just like a human relationship. It is like e-harmony or matchmaker or whatever those other things are. Because what we want to, what is it? Cupid.com. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Cupid.com. So you guys are the cupids of the prairie. So Because <laughs> what you want to do is you want to introduce them, right? You want the people to see the beauty in the other thing. Maybe the prairie will see the beauty in the person. I don't know. That gets kind of weird, but, but that's, you know, whatever. But um, let's show them the beauty. Right? Understand the beauty. That's what we do with people, right? We see someone, they're very attractive, we're drawn to them. We try to learn more about them, right? We want to understand them better. Uh, and ultimately, we become reconciled in harmony with them, right? It's a relationship that we're building. And that's exactly what, if we really want long term change, and if we really want to convert people, that's the way you do it. It's not through the intellectual side of put, throwing facts at them. There's absolutely no reason in the world why old steam trains should still exist. There's no practical reason in the world. Right? They're absolutely useless, right? Why do they exist? Why do we have these all over the place? Yeah, there's beauty. Nostalgic. Nostalgic. Yeah, and people love them. People love them, right? It's the same thing with the same thing with butterflies. You know, we could people love these old trains because of the nostalgia, because of the beauty. Um, that's why they exist, is because people love them. Just like Jacques Cousteau said, people will only protect what they love, and that applies to trains in addition to nature. 
right? We'll only protect what we love. So our number one job is to get people to fall in love with Khan's of Prairie, with the Prairie ecosystem. Um, and then they will take care of them. That's a very practical thing. Even if our motives are really non-romantic and very practical, you know, we want more stewards out there, we want more conservations. That's still the strategy, I think, to make that very practical goal happen. So we give joy through the gift of beauty. That you see these joy, these uh, gifts overlap. Um, and I, I, I want to share this little, little thing with you too, this little tidbit related to this. I, I, I made a note to myself there, happier carpenters. John Ruskin was a philosopher, artist, uh, sort of Renaissance kind of person. And he would teach, in his village uh, in Europe there, he would teach people to draw. He would teach sketching and drawing. And when he was asked about that, he said he wasn't trying to make carpenters into artists. He was just trying to make happier carpenters. And I think that's a wonderful way of thinking about what you do here. You know, maybe your goal shouldn't necessarily be to turn everybody into a plant ecologist, but just turn them into happier people, right? Just to enrich their lives. That might be, that might be even a more fruitful job. I don't know if the world needs more plant ecologists. Maybe they do, but they certainly need happier people in our world, in our, in our community. And so maybe our goal should be uh, out there on the trail, and as we think about the uh, master nationals, so maybe happier carpenters, so to speak, through the gift of Back to the miraculous thing, you know, like this Albert Einstein quote, there's only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as everything is. And so I trust that you'll go forth and, and as you go out on the cons of prairie, that maybe you'll see, if you'll take that second approach and see everything along the trail as a miracle. I think that will really uh, feed your passion and really flavor your interpretation in a very positive way. Okay, the last gift, and then we're done for tonight. And that's the gift of hope. The world is pretty dark. And, Stormy place, and but uh, and hope is is an antidote to despair. And you guys, as docents, as interpreters, have a really unique and wonderful opportunity to actually give this gift of hope. The repeated refrains of nature give hope. You know, on uh, on 9/11, I was trapped in Indianapolis, Indiana, at a meeting. I traveled a lot, and not surprisingly, I was gone when that happened. But I had a lot of people um, contact me, former students and stuff, and say, you know, Ted, we have a bat program tonight. Do you think it would be appropriate to do a bat program or tomorrow night or this weekend? I mean, we have programs. You know, do you think we should do it? Is that... My response was, I don't know if you would agree, but my response was, yeah, we need that now more than ever, you know? And on September 12th, on the morning of September 12th, you know, birds were still migrating, flowers were still blooming, butterflies were still migrating. I mean, that repeated consistency of nature Gave, well, I think a lot of people found hope in that. And, uh, and it continues to give us hope, even through our troubled times today. It doesn't have to be 9-11. It could be the tornadoes in Oklahoma or whatever. And you find hope in nature. Likewise, you know, if you, uh, if you happen to be doing more history interpretation, um, you know, human creativity, integrity, courage, all these the historical events, as we look back in history, we can find hope in the actions of, of previous uh, people and uh, historical figures that can encourage us in, in difficult times as well. And so those are the tools of the interpreter, whether you're a historic site, whether you're a natural site, you have a wonderful opportunity of actually uh, giving hopeful me messages. And hope is really critical to both conservation and uh, well-being, um, personal well-being. I've, I've read uh, uh, Buster Brown, a pretty famous conservationist, in talking about Africa. He said, the greatest threat to African conservation is the loss of hope. And I agree, I haven't spent quite a bit of time in Africa. Too many people were just thrown in the towel. And that's even a threat here in America, too, I think, is you just sort of give up, you know, shrug it off, you lose hope. There's nothing we can do about it, everything's going down the tubes. You know, we see so much destruction of habitats and of nature and things, and it's very easy to become hopeless, to be discouraged. Uh, so hope is really critical. It's also critical to personal well being. Um, there's a way of measuring personal hope, like how hopeful you are, psychologists have come up with. And one little tidbit, a total piece of trivia I'll share with you, but hopeful people floss their teeth more. <laughs> Just in case you're ever on a game show and need to know that. Or but, isn't that weird? but it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, hopeful people take care of themselves better because they're, they, see the, they see a future, right? I mean, if you have no hope about a future, you don't care, right? About dental hygiene or whatever. I mean, that's, that's the effect that hope has on personal well-being. You know? it's, it's a huge factor. Now, when I say hope, this is this quote, Dr. Havel, he was, 
He was in jail, he was imprisoned by the communists in the Soviet Union when he wrote this. He ultimately became the uh, leader of the Czech Republic. Just died actually fairly recently. Uh, but it's an orientation of the spirit. So what I want to talk about hope, I don't want you to think I'm talking about some bubbly optimism, like, oh, everything's going to be great, everything's rosy, we don't have any problems. It's not that, it's not a naivete, but it's just that it's something, it's more of an innate, beyond the horizon sort of thing. Um, One, well, I'll sneak in one more story, but Admiral Stockdale, who was a uh, prisoner of war in Vietnam, longest held American prisoner in Vietnam, very, oh, I don't know what to say, what word to use, but he would be one of those prisoners that would hit himself and cut himself so that he couldn't be used as propaganda films and so forth in Vietnam. But he ultimately, he ultimately survived. And um, when he was asked, why did you survive and so many of the other men didn't, he said, well, that's easy. He said the ones that the ones that did not survive were the optimists. And the guy interviewing him, as this story's told, is the optimists. Why? What do you mean? He said, well, the, the optimists, the guys that just couldn't stand it, were the, were the guys that said, we'll be out by the 4th of July. We'll be out by Thanksgiving. We'll be out by Christmas. You know, they had very specific short-term dates. And then it was just crushing when those dates came and gone. He said, that's the difference between optimism and hope. He said, I had hope, I had faith that everything would turn out well. Uh, you know, to use this quote, obviously, he didn't, he didn't know anything about this guy, but, but it's sort of beyond the horizon. When he couldn't pin it down, he wasn't setting dates, but he had this general, heartfelt feeling, this hope, this deep-seated hope that he would survive and that everything would turn out well. And actually, as part of this interview, he said that he wouldn't even have, he wouldn't replace that experience for anything, which I find that even hard to fathom. Like, he almost loses his credibility when he says that to me. He's like, oh, what do you mean? That was, that, he said it was such a valuable experience in his life. Uh, to learn about hope and so forth, but yeah, so so again, we can give hope out on the trail here. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't talk about problems and things, but um, uh, but if you don't have hope, why are you even here, right? I mean, if you think everything's going to heck in the handbasket anyway, what's the use of trying to save a little prairie, right, or whatever? I mean, see, you almost, I, almost by definition, if you're going to be an interpreter, you're going to be a hopeful person. Scott Russell Sanders says we don't to live in hope. We did. We don't need to believe that everything will turn out well, and only we're on the right path. And so, um, that's, this comes from a book called Hunting for Hope. And he wrote, he's, he's a professor at Indiana University, great environmental writer, conservation writer. He went to Colorado with his son once, and, and being a hardcore environmentalist, doom and gloom kind of guy, he was harping about all the building on the front range of the Rockies. Many of you have experienced this, and probably many of us have complained about it too, you know. It used to be Fort Collins was here, and Loveland was here, and Denver was here, and now it's one big metroplex, right? And so he was moaning and groaning about this. Well, his kid gets ticked off, his kid's college-age kid. And I'm listening to his dad moan and complain about all this. So he doesn't even talk to his dad. They, they, they go up to a rocky start on their hike, they're not talking to each other. The dad doesn't know what's wrong with this kid. Finally, it all comes, make a long story short, finds out that the kid says, oh, basically, you're telling me there's been the whole world's going to heck, there's nothing I should look forward to, I have no future, I mean, there's no hope, everything's going down the tubes. And, and so the author, Scott Russell Sanders, felt very convicted by this. He thought, well, you know, what can I say that's hopeful? So he wrote this book called Hunting for Hope. And in response to his son, really, he comes up with seven or eight things that we can be hopeful about. But yeah, so you as interpreters, you can reinforce people on the right path, you know? You can encourage people on the right path. You can provide alternative paths for people to give them, to give them more hope. So my feeling is that doom and gloom messages sort of just make gloomy people. <laughs> and that's not really very productive. I think it really pays to sort of be looking up uh, and looking up and out towards the future. I had mentioned that passion was the priceless ingredient, or love. Tilden used the word love. I used the word passion in my book, because love is kind of loaded sometimes. But, but love or passion is the priceless ingredient. And then uh, I think hope is the essential ingredient, because again, if you don't have hope, probably kind of wasting your time and it would be hard for you to sort of justify your efforts, I would imagine. So I, I think most of you are hopeful, but the idea is to be able to share that hope with others is really a rewarding and a wonderful thing. So um, thank you in advance, maybe, for all the gifts that you're going to give the people here at Kanza and the other places where you serve. And, um, and I wish you the best as you go forth and give the gifts of interpretation. Thank you. Thank you.